are uh, we are live. We found Dr. Farmer, and he's over on the Pacific Coast in his beautiful home. And uh, I'm so glad you're here. And again, since I was gone and came back, I see a bunch more have joined us. I, just for those of you who did not um, hear me before, I'm Jacob Nordby. I'm the marketing director with Hierophant Publishing and Insight Events USA. And it's my great privilege to work with some of the top uh, and emerging authors and speakers and teachers of our day. And, you know, I've got to meet Dr. Stephen Farmer with some other events we did with him uh, this last year and we are publishing his new book called Healing Ancestral Karma later this year. So that's part of the reason we're offering this uh, session tonight with him is to give you a chance to learn what this book is all about and why it's so important and so I'm really excited to offer Dr. Farmer to you and I'm just going to bounce over here to the uh, to the page and and just tell you so tonight we're gonna learn you know what actually is ancestral karma and you know how to clear and, and heal karmic wounds and what these things even mean and then what that actually will do for us like you know because of this so then what will happen in my life and so Dr. Farmer is gonna be giving us some highlights from that and uh, since he's the guy you want to talk to let me introduce him Dr. Farmer thanks for being here Oh, thanks, Jacob. Very nice introduction, and uh, sorry for the delay, folks, but uh, we got it wired. <laughs> Ready to roll. I'm uh, very, I, I would say I'm very excited about this book. It was uh, one that's been about three years in the making, and I actually was teaching this and writing about it and then um, contracted to do the book, Healing Ancestral Karma. And no doubt the first question a lot of people have is, well, what is that? You know, what's ancestral karma? We usually think of karma if you go from uh, uh, karmas from Hinduism, which the implication is that whatever you're uh, not finished with here, when you go to the next lifetime, you still have to complete. There's something still to uh, complete in the subsequent lifetimes. But it's also taken on some different meanings, and certainly when we speak of ancestral karma, it really is about the kind of um, karma, both positive and negative, even though the book is subtitled Healing, uh, Freeing Yourself from Unhealthy Family Patterns, uh, it really is about um, uh, positive karma too, those gifts that you have from the ancestors. Uh, Jacob, my, uh, my interest began uh, years ago when I visited my sister in uh, good old Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and that's where I'm originally from. I grew up there until I was 12 years old. And I went back there a few years ago. And um, I, uh, she, her place was too small for me to stay there. So I was staying in a hotel. So at that, that one evening at the hotel, I'm just sort of getting some fresh air walking around the grounds. And I hear this voice in my head. And um, it, it really didn't feel or sound like my voice. It was really uh, a voice of an a very ancient one, an ancestor, is, is, uh, as I would call him, one of the old ones. And as I'm walking around, I heard this voice say, you're walking on the bones of your ancestors. <laughs> and I love that way of putting it. It's not the way I would ordinarily talk either. Walking on the bones of my ancestors. And I, it was one of those, huh, interesting moments. Um, one that I had to ponder a little bit as I continued walking. I had somewhat of a, a revelation that uh, although my, my people, my biological lineage has not lived there for centuries, there's about four generations back that they uh, came to the area now known as Iowa. And so in a very real sense, the, my ancestors were in not just in spirit world, but they were in the land, which is not an uncommon way of uh, viewing ancestors for many indigenous cultures and the ones I'm most familiar with are the Hawaiian, the old Hawaiian spirituality and the Aboriginal, uh, Australian Aboriginal um, cultures. And that really set me back a little bit just make, to think about it, well that's really true, they're in the air, they're in the clouds, they're in the trees, they're in the ground, it was just a really different way to look at it even though I would sort of dabbled with it before but this really impacted me and then <laughs> I heard the voice say, can you imagine if your ancestors had lived on this land for 10,000 years? And uh, that took me back even further. I had to stop and uh, take a deep breath on that one. It was like, wow, no, I can't. I, it's really difficult to get my, 
my hands and my mind around that. And, and it's not unusual in our culture, in our Western civilization. It's a very mobile society. How many in the uh, group that's listening could say that they've lived on the same land as even two generations, let alone 10,000 years? Very few of us. In fact, there were uh, many, many nations here in the United States uh, before the Europe Europeans came and settled and then sort of pushed them into reservations and such. Sad story that has taken place in many, many uh, areas of the world. But nonetheless, I, I was taken aback by that. And then as I paused again to think about it, the next uh, piece that came was uh, the voice saying, can you imagine if your ancestors or if you, your family had, uh, your people had gone, had lived here for 100,000 years? And again, no, Jacob, I could not. I, I couldn't, I, I, but yet it, was, it still was astounding, but I couldn't nearly imagine that. And uh, it's been said that um, in Australia, the original people of Australia, they're called aboriginals, uh, really do go back 60 to 100,000 years. And having a little bit of familiarity with that culture, um, it makes a great deal of sense. And uh, in that culture particularly, yes, the ancestors are very much part of the land. So um, that's really what started the ball rolling. And then one thing led to another, and I came across some other material on, on ancestral karma that I found just fascinating. Uh, created a workshop on it, which I'm going to be doing in the uh, not-too-distant future. Once the book is out, I'll be doing a few different places. Um, that there's actually ways that we can incorporate uh, uh, the ancestors in our spiritual path. And I, I think, Jacob, that's something that we really seriously lacked in our Western civilization. We think of... Uh, Grandma and Grandpa's deceased loved ones, and right. legitimate, uh, certainly. But I want to. My I'm, part of my mission is to reframe that. To, yes, they're deceased loved ones, but uh, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa are um, are really ancestors, and we can contact those ancestors and we can incorporate them in our lives. I'd say the vast. Uh, well, I'm not sure about vast majority, but so many other cultures have. Um, have the ans their ancestors worked into their lives in a very active way, mm -hmm. and we don't. We really don't typically do that. So that's the gist of what I'm aiming to do with uh, with this book and with the classes and workshops and even the private healing sessions, uh, is to really bring the ancestors in even more and more consciously. Uh, they want to help us. Uh, we're in a real time of big, big change here on the earth, and uh, they really want to help us. So, Dr. Farmer, and, and I'm, I'm so excited about this, and I have some interesting, not identical, of course, but parallel, uh, you know, experiences, which I won't talk about those tonight, but I'm excited to hear you share your own. And uh, I want to take just a minute, if we could, and just welcome. Um, the room has continued to fill up even more since we started, and I see people, uh, Dr. Farmer, from uh, Massachusetts, from Texas, from the East Coast, from West Coast. Um, we have people from England and from other parts of, the, of, the, of the, the globe. So what this tells me is that there's a great deal of interest in uh, your topic tonight. And I have a couple of private chat questions here in particular saying, you know, I know about karma. How do I know if it's holding me back in my life? And what, what does your work in this book and what we're talking about tonight, how, is that, how does that help me how do I recognize when karma is actually holding me back, and then how do I deal with it? That's what I'm seeing come through right now. Well, I think a lot of us, uh, at one time or another in our lives, really feel like we've we've hit a block or a, a wall of some sort in our own uh, our own path and our own evolution, our own spiritual development. Um, I don't, I would I think it's safe to say that, uh, gosh, nearly everyone, probably not. I won't even say probably. I think nearly everyone has some of that uh, unhealthy family patterns. Hmm. I, can look at, uh, I can look at my own family and go, wow, yeah. You know, I, can, I, I, I grew up in a, um, the, my family of origins at least, I grew up a, a, great, a great father. I really love this man and I've cleared a lot of my uh, karma, if you will, uh, with regard to him. Uh, and yet he uh, it was an alcoholic family, the typical alcoholic family. Uh, my mother was... Uh, uh, God bless her. I, I feel very clear with her at this stage of my life. Uh, but she was growing up really ambivalent about uh, wanting me. Uh, my mother came to me in a uh, 
And that's one of the fascinating things is we open ourselves up to this, we can start communicating with the ancestors. And in response to your question, that's one way we can start clearing this karma up. She came to me one time uh, and she apologized. She, she made amends, I guess you would say. Uh, she explained that uh, she had three children when she met my father and she wasn't real sure she wanted me. And that, that really you know, hit a place in my gut when I heard her say that to me. Uh, she was always ambivalent. She loved me uh, in her own way. She, I know she did the best she could. That's just not a, an aphorism. I know she did the best she could because uh, I, I, and, and it, it wasn't that I said, oh, I forgive you, Mom. It was a feeling of just releasing and letting go um, you could say these energy patterns, these, these karmic patterns that I was carrying of, of feeling invisible, uh, feeling uh, uncertain about my path in life, uh, not, not being seen, not being recognized, etc. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that answers the question completely, but any kind of investigation into your own healing, psychological, mental, uh, emotional, phys physical healing, when you investigate, uh, for instance, Louise Hay has talked about that, that every physical ailment has a metaphysical uh, uh, cause, if you will. If, I, if my stomach hurts, maybe I got hit in the gut. Uh, I'm remembering a friend of mine, actually uh, Australian, uh, he's uh, Caucasian, but uh, he found out at 16 years old that, his, um, that he was half Aboriginal. His father was Aboriginal. Grandfather came, took him up to the land in northern Queensland, and um, he went through an initiation for two years. Finally went and met his father, and uh, his father was in prison, and found out that he had some of the same injuries on his left side, almost exactly, that his father did. Now, how do you explain something like that other than a karmic um, inheritance, if you will? Uh, my, uh, my father's... Uh, and I, this is not about blame mom and dad either. It's way beyond that because it goes back a few generations. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, you, I could think I, uh, for the listener who asked that question, I think you could safely assume that you know, when you feel blocked in some way, when you feel like you have repetitive patterns that show up again and again and again, that just you, you've tried this and this and that, that it's time to bring, and, and nothing has worked, it's time to bring the ancestors in and ask for their help and their guidance in healing, whatever it is, mental, again, mental, physical, uh, emotional, psychological, whatever it may be. Well, and Dr. Farmer, um, one thing, I've, I'm looking here at, at your other work, and many people who are joining us tonight, and by the way, just real quick, I want to say hello to everyone. Again, uh, we've had some folks join us from Mexico. <laughs> this is really cool. People are still popping in from all over the place, but many people... Um, Stephen, don't know your work, and uh, you know you you've published through Hay House and some other places. You have books uh, like the Animal Spirit Guides, uh, Earth Magic, your Power Animal Oracle Cards, and Cer Sacred Ceremonies, and of course now we're doing this book um, with you this year. I'm so excited about it. But there must be I know uh, you know from having done work with you in some of these other events, you have um, you work with people in a very direct way and you've had personal direct experience in session with you know both crowds of people and individuals and you must see some common pains like ouch this is stopping me in my life could you could you list off maybe two or three of the most common ones um, that, that just come to mind where people have said this is stopping me and they didn't really understand it um, it didn't make sense in their life like why this was happening but as you unwound it uh, you were able to help them make that metaphysical connection. Do you have any examples like that? Yeah, I, you know, I think, Jacob, the first one that comes to mind is, is what you could say is perhaps the greatest wound of all that I think many of us have suffered and perhaps still suffer, which is, and I, I want to say that I want everybody to hear this very carefully, it's the illusion of separation from spirit. Mm -hmm. And I know from your work and conversations, and I've seen some of your writings, Jacob, that you, you do what you can to stay attuned to that. So uh, I encourage everybody to find some sort of spiritual discipline that helps you uh, remember. Mm -hmm. I had a mentor one time who said to me, uh, 
in a conversation, he said, you know, Stephen, all this stuff we do, these encounter trainings and therapy and, and this and that, you know, it's just all, all this is just to help us remember who we really are. Mm -hmm. And that was a very simple yet profound statement is, yes, uh, whatever can help us remember who we are, I think, helps us resolve that spiritual wound. We've drifted um, as a, certainly as a culture, I'm not sure as a species, but certainly as a culture. Uh, it's difficult to reconcile the, uh, one's spirituality with the fact of being human, that we have our human foibles, we have our human aches and pains, we have our, you could say, our flaws or whatever, our misgivings or... Uh, uh, like the, when, when I couldn't get into the webinar, you know, I had a, about a 10-second tantrum, you know, and got over it very quickly, but <laughs> I had a 10 second, I'm a human being, you know, that's one thing. So um, I think that, again, I go back to something like patterns. More than any specific things, it might be patterns. Excuse me, not might be, it is patterns that I would look for. That's what I would suggest. Example, if I were, let's say, to get angry so readily and reactive so readily, at, at minor, relatively minor things again and again and again, to me, that's something that's come down the pike through my ancestors. Mm -hmm. And as James Hillman, who I'm sure you're familiar with, has said, it, it's not just the parents. You know, we tend to be a culture where we look at the parents. Yeah, that helps, but it goes back further than that. Mm -hmm. um, so we may have to look a little deeper than just mom and dad. You know, maybe mom was uh, uh, abused, and so she abuses. Uh, so, which brings up another one. That's another one is uh, we're hearing more and more about this these days, and I think rightfully so, post-traumatic stress response. I don't like disorder, <laughs> but post-traumatic stress response, if, if you have been traumatized, especially if it's been repeated trauma over a, uh, six months or more, um, what's going to happen is that your, um, your instinctual adaptations to that trauma serve the purpose of helping you survive that experience, but what happens is those symptoms continue to linger on. An example would be <clears throat> startle reaction. You know, just uh, you get startled very, very easily. Uh, uh, in the in the polar the the other polarity of that is psychic numbing. You know, just feeling flat. You know, sometimes comes off as depression. I think from my experience, because I, I I don't recall if you mentioned, but I'm a former psychotherapist too, so I've got both the psychotherapy and the shamanic which is what led me into doing this work with ancestors as well. Um, but looking for patterns like that, I think, uh, I think are really important because it's not just the trauma, it's what, where did that come from? You know, let's look back two, three generations, um, which is pretty much all we have to go. That's about as far as we go because after that it gets pretty diffuse. For instance, ten generations, if you go back ten generations, 1,024 ancestors. Mm -hmm. If you go back 20 generations, it's well over a million ancestors. Yeah. Which also is another part of this mission is to really support the idea, not just as a, a saying that you throw out, you know, we are all one, but whoa, when you look at that, you know, we are really much more the same than we are different. 99.99% of our genetic sequencing as human beings is exactly the same. Let me repeat that, 99.99%. And it's time that we start looking at that and seeing that we're not that much different from that person that we've just made a judgment about. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent, but I feel very passionate about this. Yeah. It's time for this new order to emerge, this new way of being human. Um, and accept our humanity, but not get caught up in it. So here's a here's a thought. If you don't mind me uh, being Please. extra personal, is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. I had a pretty powerful experience this last weekend, um, Stephen, and um, it you know I've done a lot of work. You know, you and of course you're you've been on your own journey longer than I have um, in this lifetime. But I've done a lot of work and I've uncovered a lot of things and had a tremendous amount of liberation. But um, one thing that uh, I wasn't even able to see as an unconscious pattern. Uh, most people know me as, you know, uh, one of the nicest guys th they'll ever find. That just seems to be kind of my way in the world, and um, uh, that's that's both gets me a lot of places, which is nice, but it also has limited me when it comes time to really assert myself and step into my own authority, and especially yeah. as it relates to, um, you know, 
like female authority figures, and I've never had any rebellion with that. There's not been anger and like pushing back, but there was some limiting. Like I would really, you know, just go into extra um, accommodation mode. And uh, I had an experience this weekend that really highlighted that. And you know, of course, I had a, a loved partner with me who was able to really help me through it and call me out of that unconscious pattern and see how limiting it was. And it was because it was so personal and just this last weekend, I wanted to share that with you. And, um, it, you know, I, I didn't really examine it in this case for ancestral ties, but at least in this lifetime, uh, and perhaps you'd like to talk about that, but at least in this yeah. lifetime, um, it, it was a clear limitation for me to, to step fully into my purpose, fully into uh, my authority and what's possible in this life. And yes. I feel that some big things got cleared this weekend. And, and I, I have to imagine that a lot of people listening have their own examples of things somewhat like that. And, and please uh, take that wherever you'd like to. I just wanted to share it because it was so powerful and so recent. I get it. It's, it's a beautiful experience. And thank you. Um, what happens is that whatever the healing is, whether with or without a conscious attention to ancestors, yeah. one of the things that I know is that when you die, you ain't done. <laughs> you know, there's still more work to do. There's shards of the ego. There's shards or remnants, you know, of whatever still needs to be cleaned up. And when you, and I mean not just you, Jacob, but you, when, when you, general you, when you do the work, whatever it is, you know, you could do uh, emotional freedom technique, EMDR, uh, somatic experiencing, you could do hypnosis, you could do uh, any of the healing, uh, uh, family constellation therapy. Uh, there's a number of things that, that are available to us to heal. And when you heal, you heal both backwards and forwards. In other words, it affects your descendants. Yeah. I feel I've got two daughters, grown daughters, and I've got two stepdaughters here with Jessica that um, I influence and provide a stepfather role with them. And my daughters, I think, have just been great about being able to um, clear things with me, you know, my misgivings, my, my uh, failings, especially my oldest daughter. We, you know, she, she and I, she's great. She comes, we've had two conversations where um, I owned it. I said I'm not, I wasn't a perfect father. Now that allows her not only to heal, not, not only does that allow her to heal, but it allows her my descendants beyond her to not have to carry that burden. What you did, the healing that took place for you, will affect not only your ancestors, again, whether you're conscious or you're thinking of it that way or not, but will help them move along in their spiritual evolution. Mm, yes, uh, thank you. It's amazing. I, I was shown, uh, I, I, mean, I should elaborate on this, I spent about 30 years as a psychotherapist and the last 20 plus years, I would say, I, I was introduced uh, that about 22, 23 years ago to shamanism. And that has been a really beautiful blend because in shamanism, it, it aims to heal at the spiritual level. And one aspect of this healing, we're talking about healing ancestral karma, is really working with the spirit world to help us live our lives and be better people, basically. So that that will clear whatever karmic baggage we're carrying that uh, will not have to affect our descendants. Um, anyway, that that so that makes to me that makes perfect sense. The more and more I've gone into this and I've done workshops. Well, I'll tell you a short story. Okay, uh, I did uh, probably done this seven eight times this workshop on healing ancestral karma, and I'm sure I'll be doing it more in addition to you know my other workshops like you've mentioned some of the other works that I put out. Um, I did this workshop, I think it was about a year and a half ago, and uh, I got an email the very next day from one of the participants, and she wrote, she said, thank you for the workshop, it was very, very healing, very powerful. I had a dream I wanted to share with you. Uh, I saw in the dream, uh, in the forest, a fire that was in the midst of a circle of men. It was at some distance and as I walked forward I noticed the man whose back was toward me was my grandfather who is the one I worked with in the this healing this one particular process of healing ancestral karma. And she said what happened is my grandfather turned to look at me and he looked me in the eye and he says thank you. 
I can now sit in circle. Mm -hmm. That he now has a place of honor in the spirit world by her willingness to not only heal herself, but to heal this ancestor with the help of spirit, God, whatever you want to call that, um, and then in turn her descendants, whether she's aware of them or not, or whether they have arrived or not, she can send that forward to her descendants as well. Mm -hmm. So there's it just you know beautiful stories are coming from this process. And again, uh, Jacob, I'm on a mission. I I, I really want to uh, see us incorporate our our relatives who have gone before us as uh, ancestors. Don't you feel that that the we're actually asking ourselves uh, on a collective level right now to put aside our misconceptions, uh, our discomfort, perhaps, and and actually go there? Um, you talked about the Aboriginal peoples or the original peoples, and uh, you know some ones who were much more connected, let's say, to to earth and to spirit, you know, in a different way. Why do you feel that we're so dis? Why do you feel the Western world, especially, has such a discomfort on a general level with going into healing? Uh, I mean, so there's plenty of people who are okay with it, and we, of course, it's popular now in, in spirituality and things. But there's still a lot of people who feel very uncomfortable with this topic, not just karma, but healing in general. They, it's too something. Why? Why do you suppose that is? Well, I think part of it, uh, Jacob, is there's there's been a um, I would call it a dis-ease in a broader sense than just illness of um, dissociation. But not just dissociation from spirit, which I mentioned earlier, that, that um, lack of connection or the illusion of separation, but even more importantly, the dissociative characteristic that we many of us share with the earth. Uh, we have uh, been handed a long uh, karmic quality, you could say, from a a long lineage of ancestors that goes back many generations of um, sort of the attitude in I, I would say in probably a few religions of uh, we're just kind of enduring this we try to be good people so that we'll get into heaven mm -hmm. some some variation or version of that archetype and instead it's like no okay this is the life that you have now what about appreciating the beauty of this uh, this wonderful planet in in all of its tempestuousness as well it's a it's sometimes a difficult planet to just live on but on the other hand it's also a very beautiful planet you know how many sunsets have you have we seen how much can we appreciate how much can we express our gratitude not only uh, you know for just the things that happen with other people but for the fact of I can take a nice breath of air and what a miracle just to be alive and to know that that tree out there and that one out there that I can see from my windows are breathing with me. Yeah. You know, as I give off my exhalation of carbon dioxide, that tree out there is going, oh, thank you, thank you. Here, take some oxygen. Let me give you some more. And this wonder, I get chills when I say that because it's just a, it's simple. It's really simple, but we've dissociated from that, that finer, uh, connection and relationship. Uh, I, I have said many times uh, in workshops and uh, talks, it is not about saving the earth. That's Let's let that go. <laughs> We're not going to save the planet. It's been around four and a half billion years. You know, We're not, We don't need to do that. It's going to be around another five billion perhaps. Um, even no matter what, with or without us, it's going to be around five billion years. So it's not about saving the planet, but it is absolutely about revising our relationship with the planet. Not just the planet, but that tree out there, you know, with the grass that's growing, you know, with the leaves, the shrubs, this beautiful rose that I picked up today that I want to plant in my yard. That just really appreciating and being grateful for what um, Mother Earth gives to us and also the spirits that are expressing as trees, as plants, as animals. And you mentioned one of my other books, Animal Spirit Guides. Yes, they it's not just the animals, and it's not just the life force in the animals, but it's they they can they can uh, communicate to us as animal spirit guides. It's kind of a weird notion to many people, but again, indigenous people, shamanic cultures, of course, you know it's just a given. So um, I think we've just forgotten, you know, forgotten who we are. As my mentor Paul Fairweather said, uh, we just uh, we need to remember remember who we really are, but also our relationship with the the other beings on this planet. 
you know, it strikes me as you're saying this that um, the belief in original sin, and I feel that as you've been talking here tonight, I've been just feeling into that, that that isn't something that we can just dismiss with our minds. Stephen, and say, okay, I don't believe it anymore, because it does, uh, if I'm hearing you properly, it comes down to us through many generations, um, uh, you know, and so that belief in original sin, which says, I'm broken, uh, I need somebody in the sky to fix me, or something like that, I must earn my salvation, uh, and not just on a religious level, in every, it is pervasive, I feel, and then, and then the question then becomes, um, if that's the case, that also means I'm separate from nature, I'm separate from the earth, and that changes our whole experience of being here, doesn't it? Uh, it really does. It's um, the earth's here for our use. Yeah. You know, whatever we can extract from the earth, that's that's to help us uh, as a species dominate the earth. Basically, it's a you could say it's a dominance model. So uh, that's, the, that's the belief you're, we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's threatening. You know, it's threatening to walk out into the wilds when you have been raised with that. So we're actually looking at a, a, a deeper strata of what we're calling uh, the relationship with the ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, I um, I love my father. I really do. He's, he came to me just the other day in the process I use, my spiritual discipline. It's kind of like a meditation, but it's a, a shamanic journey. And, probably quite a few people who are listening know what that is or have heard about it. But it's my form of um, spiritual discipline. And when I did this journey, uh, I was taken to this area in uh, that was called the Land of the Ancestors. And who showed up with Richard, my father. And he basically, it makes me really kind of emotional as I say this, but he basically uh, offered me a blessing. He thanked me for watching out for, uh, you know, my clan. Uh, I'm now the patriarch. You know, I got the gray hair. I, made it this far, you know, so uh, I've got nephews, nieces, grandchildren, grand nieces, you know, I, uh, quite a quite a clan uh, spread out throughout the United States. Um, but also he told me uh, very specifically that my grandson, nine years old, really needed more direct contact with me. And there's a long reason for that story behind that, but uh, I, I had no doubt, I, I talked to his mom, my daughter, uh, Jaden is my grandson, and she said, you know, he does, he needs it, because his former stepfather is, uh, his, his grandma and stepfather, uh, step-grandfather, I guess you'd say, I hope this, everybody follows this, uh, he, they separated, and he was very close to this man, uh, who was a friend, as well as a, an older man, um, grandfatherly type, uh, has just walked away and stepped out of the picture, you know, very, very sad, but my father came to me and said, you need to step up the pace with the, the amount of contact you have with Jaden. I called Catherine, his mother, my daughter, and I told her that. She says, "Oh yeah, yeah. He needs you more than you know. He needs you more than ever right now because Tom, his uh, grandfather, he was close to, was uh, disappeared basically. Anyway, that's a long, uh, hopefully, understandable story. But the point is, my father, my ancestor, my father, uh, communicated this to me, and that was validated by my daughter." Uh, there's things like that that just are magical that happen when you start to work with ancestors. It's amazing, and I, I'm actually seeing, um, looking here at the chat that's coming through and some private questions and thoughts, and maybe we can have time to share a couple of these with you sure. in, a, in a little bit. But uh, one thing that it feels uh, would be really appropriate, if, if this is okay with you, would be, could you perhaps lead us uh, or at least describe what, after this session with you is over, what people might do to consciously connect with, take that journey, and actually can have that connection with the ancestors and ask for their guidance and, and what they're trying to communicate. Do you, are you okay with uh, sharing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, what I want to do is uh, have us do a little chant. Okay. So, and you're welcome to join Jacob, and I, I invite everybody else in your own uh, privacy of your own home to to uh, do this. It's an ancestor calling song, and uh, what I'll do is I'll sing it once, and then I'd like you all, uh, if you're willing to do this, is to sing it with me um, three more times. In other words, four all together. I'll I'll lead with one, and then I'd like you to join in. And the reason I'm, this is a response to your question, this is a start, is to call in the ancestors. 
it starts setting up, it starts framing that in your mind that, oh, you can call in the ancestors for guidance and protection. So that's one, one piece we'll do. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. Two more times. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. One more time. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Ancestors, ancestors, we are calling. Come, come, come. And everybody take a deep breath. And I can feel them. I think probably quite a few of you can feel their presence or, or perhaps even those of you who are more visual might even see, you know, images uh, either in your mind's eye or externally. Uh, I tend to feel things more and I hear things more than actual visual, visual sometimes. So that's one piece right there is a chant. And I, I guarantee it will bring in the benevolent ancestors. Don't worry about, oh, that creepy Uncle John, you know, is he going to come and bug me or something like that. You have to just trust that when you call with that sincerity in your heart, you're really calling the benevolent ancestors, whether it's one, two, three generations ago or 10,000 generations ago. It doesn't matter. The old ones come too. And I say the old ones. Those are the ones that have gone through their spiritual evolution and have made choices to return to help us out. They know that we're hurting right now. They know that our relationship with the earth has suffered. Second thing, close your eyes. And you can all do this right now. just takes a few seconds. Take a cup. Good, Jacob. Yeah, take a couple of deep breaths. And either in your mind or even spoken out loud. My ancestors, I would like a sign from you of your presence. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And then just wait and see what happens. Now, interesting how signs show up. Um, one of the most uh, common ones is through animals. And that's another branch uh, as an animal spirit guide. And my pitch for that is when an animal shows up in an unusual way or repeatedly in a short space of time, something really big is going on. It's You could say, well, it's just the animal. It's interesting. Crow landed right in front of me three times in a row. Well, okay, that's kind of cool. Or you could see it as possibly an ancestor has sent that crow to you. And really, not just, you see crows all the time, but landing in front of you or flying across your, your uh, windshield, or um, you uh, wake up with a big dream about a bear, something like that, and then you keep hearing about bears all day. Well, it's possible that an ancestor is trying to communicate to you through that. I've had story after story, Jacob, where after a, a, a beloved parent or grandparent dies, is an animal comes and makes itself known there's a story in the book about Cooper's Hawk, if I may just outline this as quickly as possible. They say uh, an Irishman does not know how to make a, uh, a long story short, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, these, this, I, I have permission to use the story so I can relate this. It, it's very touching. A, a couple lost their uh, four-year-old son in a tragic accident. Uh, his name was Cooper. And uh, they had never had any interest in spirituality, particularly up to that point. But then they just started getting very hungry to try to make sense of this. You know, how do you make sense of something like that? I don't know. I don't know what I, you know, it, it's probably one of the worst things that could happen uh, is to lose a, a, a child. Anyway, so they, they went on their journey and their search. And uh, one day the man said, the husband said, came home and there's this hawk sitting in the middle of the road and not moving. So he says, this is weird. You know, so he gets out his camera, he calls his wife, he texts his wife, he got to come see this. This hawk showed up for the next four days. And he, uh, he determined initially that it was a red-tailed hawk. But then they went and they looked it up. And there's a type of hawk called Cooper's Hawk. Isn't that amazing? So 
and I believe too that it, it, anybody who goes before children too are ancestors. They are connected to us across that barrier, or that seeming barrier at least. So it's a wonderful story, and, and God bless the parents for sharing that. I think it's a good teaching. Helps us know that the ancestors do try to reach us, and that's one way is through the animal spirits. Uh, not, not just the animal spirits, but the, the animal and who represents uh, sort of as a courier for the, the grandparent or the child or whoever it may be that's gone before. You know, Dr. Farmer, one thing uh, that, you know, I was raised a fundamentalist Christian and then, and then you know, went out in the world and uh, did my best to be a normal guy. And uh, one thing I have found, though, was I had this deep hunger to, it wasn't just an interest, it was really a big, like, gnawing hunger to know what my purpose was. And I felt at some level I was way off purpose. And, um, mm -hmm. and, it, and at one point I... Uh, you know, I, I without even knowing what I was getting into, I got involved with a shamanic experience, and it changed my life. And that's why, you know, as I talk with you tonight, and of course learn more about your work, I, I love this because, you know, here's a normal guy who wouldn't have gone looking for something like that. I'm talking about myself, who began to get my window on the world was this big, and it began to broaden. Mm -hmm. And as that happened, then I became open to some of the things you're talking about tonight, and. One of my early teachers, who was a shaman, said to me one time, um, just understand that Great Mother, which is all the earth and all of us, all these things around us, you know, it's always speaking, and it speaks in signs and symbols, and as you're talking about tonight, animals and all these different things, and I found myself in a different kind of reality, and again, it was just, it was just a matter of seeing the world like this, right. and the window get a little larger, and it, and it gets larger all the time now, and I... I'm excited about that, and as I've done that, the information's come through to help me actually find my path with heart, find purpose, and, cool. and that's, that's changed my life. And it feels like that's, I'm watching some of the questions coming through, and it feels like that's one of the big questions that is being asked both tonight and in general is, how do I find my life? How do I find my soul purpose? How do I know what it is? And, and I know that's one of the things we listed on the webinar description, which you're going to talk about that. Uh, yeah, it, it, finding your soul's purpose is is not a um, how would I say it's not an event necessarily. Yeah. Um, it's like for you that I believe, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but it was like a, a spark plug, <laughs> you know, right. an initiation into uh, as you as you described it very well, expanding your vision and your sense of what this was about for you. So first thing I would say is it's it's a process, it's an experiment. Um, I, it took me a while to to really capture my my soul's purpose in words, and I find that if what I did is tried this word on, and then tried this word on, and then tried this word on to see what really resonated with my heart, my heart of hearts. And at this stage, it's it's really three words that I would say um, for me capture my soul's purpose, which is healer, teacher, and communicator. Although my wife would tell you I don't communicate so well sometimes, but I think I do pretty good. All things given, but I, you know, healer, teacher, communicator. I'm a natural. I mean, uh, uh, healing has been something I've been doing my whole life, one way or the other. I, I laugh because I remember sitting my parents down. We had just moved from Iowa to California, and they were bickering like crazy. My dad was drinking; it was nuts. And I actually sat them down at age 14 and counseled them. I said, okay, Mom, Dad, have a seat. We're going to talk. <laughs> and I mediated this conversation between the two of them. I thought, that's crazy for a 14-year-old to do. But it was an indication, you know, uh, what do you call it, foreshadowing of my soul's purpose. So three, that's another one. I forget if I'm on two or three, but that's another way to look is, well, what have you been drawn to? What is your passion? What, what has been something that's, a, that's almost a natural that if you look back on your stories like I just shared, oh, Okay, I loved to paint when I was eight, but I got shamed because somebody laughed at a painting. Oh, I love to sing. Uh, a dear mentor of mine, Angela Sarian, just passed. I just got word. I was so sad to hear that, but she had a good full life. And that's what she is. She's an anthropologist, or was, that studied and put everything in four, studied a lot of different cultures. And I love this thing, this four, four questions that when you go to the shaman, 
uh, he or she will ask you these four questions. You know, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop being enchanted by stories? And number four is a corker. When did you stop listening to the sweet sound of silence? And that's for my dear teacher, who is now an ancestor. She's with me. She she had a little glimmer of her the other day. She's now uh, in the afterlife, but uh, I can feel and sometimes see her smiling. Uh, she died, uh, I guess, uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, still has left a, an incredible legacy. I kind of went off a little bit uh, in terms of the question, so uh, that's your job, though, to keep me on track. So. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> actually, uh, yeah, good luck. You know, actually, uh, you know, I can see we have a, a very full room. More have joined us. It looks like everyone's really engaged with what you're saying tonight. And I, you know, you're a storyteller. I love that. Yeah. And uh, and of course, as I responded to you, I've been telling sto stories as well. Which so it sounds like we're we're so similar in that way. You know, one thing that comes um, a question, direct question here, and um, specifically asked not to use names, but here's the question: I grew up in a Christian family was always cautioned about working with spirits. That cautioning was so drummed into me for so long, I have a hard time not letting it interfere with my work with the spirit world. And she said, can you speak to this? It's an issue of demons disguised as helpers. So there's that teaching that, you know, beware of who appears as an angel of light because it could be, the, could be the devil or whatever. Yeah, well, that's a tough one. Uh, I respect and appreciate the uh, listeners' uh, concern about that. You had to deal with that yourself, as you said, growing up in a fundamentalist Christian family, and you seem to have uh, succeeded very well in making that passage. Um, I, I know, I think, first off, I think it's a revision of your relationship with Jesus. You know, in a sense, in a sense, Jesus is sort of an ancestor, you know, in a sense. And you can work with uh, Christ in a different way. Uh, you can have a personal relationship that's outside of the boundaries of doctrine and dogma. Uh, I, I, I would appeal to this individual to experiment a little bit, have conversations with Jesus, take Jesus with you. Or you can, if you're a little uncomfortable with that still, uh, call on Archangel Michael. If you're still uncomfortable with that, call on Wolf Spirit. I go, uh, one of my guardians... Um, because I work with um, a handful of uh, specific uh, spirit animals, it's wolf. Wolf spirit, not the animal, not just, uh, I don't have wolves out in the backyard or anything like that, but wolf spirit. I completely feel protected. I do not feel concerned at all, ever. And I mean ever. I'm very solid about that, that I'm never going to have to um, um, be psychically attacked or uh, have demons show up in some way. You know an interesting thing about the word demon? Uh, it comes from the word daemon, D-A-I-M-O-N, which was a uh, guardian spirit, typically in the form of an animal. There we go again. You know, let's divorce ourselves. Let's dissociate from anything of the earth and call it evil. Yeah. Anyway, it's just a little sidelight about the word demon, but it's reframing it that, uh, and it's still a spooky word. I know that because it's planted in our culture. You know, it's planted in our brains from our culture. So to this person, I would say, yeah, work with Jesus. If it, that's not comfortable, work with Archangel Michael. And just every time you feel uh, uh, uncertain about something, uh, call on that 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 uh, ascended master. Or, and my pitch would be, uh, learn about animal spirit guides. Call on animal spirit animals as uh, for protection guidance. Call on ancestors, and I'm talking about the old ones. You know, not necessarily grandma and grandpa. Well, they work pretty well sometimes, but call on the, when I say the old ones, the ancient ones, the one the one I work with and uh, came to me in an initiation years ago on Cone Peak in Big Sur is, uh, uh, claims to be 25,000 years old. In other words, he was on the earth 25,000 years ago. Now, am I making that up? I don't know, but I, he's been a great guide and teacher and he works with me directly in, in the healing process. So I call on him whenever I get nervous or scared or I'm going into a situation where I feel uncertain. Uh, and he's been, a, he's been with me, I learned later, he's been with me my whole life. So yeah. I, I trust that, that that helps a bit for this person and others who might be dealing with the same thing. It's kind of scary to be have, have to deal with that indoctrination. That's really what it is, like brainwashing. 
Well, it, it clearly is, and, and I can see from some other chat that's come through as you've been explaining that, that uh, it's a common question. Um, so I appreciate that being brought up. And here's another one. Um, let me find it here. This one's from Venezuela. Parents were from Spain. I'm living in Mexico for the last 10 years. The last five years I had were in some way terrible. Now I have to move to the U.S., and I'm wondering if finally I cleared the karma in this country, and now I have this incredible opportunity to live in the U.S. And so I, I'm interpreting that question as to say there's been a lot of hard stuff going on in these sort of ancestral country, co countries, and now she's feeling perhaps clear to come here and wondering if maybe she's done the work that was needed to be done or something. Can you can you help me with that? Absolutely. As I said, um, even in relation to the questions about soul purpose, is sometimes you have to wander a little bit to you to you just begin to discover through that process. So by contrast, I would say, yes, move to the U.S. and see how it feels, but bring your spirit guides with you, you know, ask your spirit guides to help you out with this. Look for omens and signs. Again, this is something that's so, it's a given in indigenous cultures. Is is um, It's a given in, uh, sorry, I got distracted, a silly message came through. Uh, it's a given in indigenous and shamanic cultures that the world communicates to us, just as you were commenting earlier, Jacob. Uh, it, it's a matter of learning how to listen better. And that's part of my mission, again, for myself, as well as anybody I teach, come across, do any healing work with, is, is encourage different ways that we can listen, like through the animal spirit guides, like going up to a tree, talking to a tree, sit by a tree, ask tree to help you, call on the ancestors, you know, call on... Uh, um, benevolent ancestors. If you want to qualify it, call it, qualify it and say, I'm calling on the benevolent ancestors and do that chant and then ask them for the guidance to give you signs. I mean, there's a number of ways you can do that. You can do automatic writing, uh, which is you, you ask an ancestor, a benevolent one to come through, or an old one, and you say, I'd like some guidance about my um, potential move to the United States. And then you sit down with your pen in a very relaxed way by breathing and just allow your hand, listen to how I say this too, you let your hand write. It's as if it's dissociated from you. That's how it feels when spirit is coming through. And see what, the, see what shows up on the paper. So, question for you. Um, by the way, Dr. Farmer, I don't know if any, everybody knew when they uh, registered for the webinar, but it gave, you know, gave us the opportunity to read their minds. Um, I'm just kidding. But... Uh, <laughs> Just kidding, guys. No, but um, I, I can actually feel into one of the questions that, you know, for, for those of us who were raised in the West, uh, you know, and we've really married the rational mind, uh, you know, and the scientific process and all that, and so we've been really, even those who weren't raised religiously have been brainwashed only to believe what's provable uh, in a scientific way, let's say. How would you address some of the things you've talked about tonight I can actually sort of feel into and read the read the thoughts that are going like, okay, that sounds. I'm willing to do that, but how do I know if I'm just making it up or not? How do I how do I actually know it's a message rather than just something I'm hoped would happen? So then I made it up to give myself guidance. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's a common. It's a, a question that often comes up in uh, workshops where we do experiential exercises of some sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, one thing I say to people is I say, if I'm making this up, I'm having a great time. And it's <laughs> working for me. So, um, But in a more um, uh, straightforward response to that, it, it's, it's uh, the story of Joan, Arc, Joan of Arc comes to mind where she was asked by the Inquisitor's story, or I don't know if it's true, but, you know, they say never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But anyway, so uh, Joan of Arc supposedly was asked by one of the Inquisitors, says, Joan. Now, you say you uh, hear the voice of God, right? And she said, of course. Yes, I do. Because how do you know it's not just your imagination? And she says, well, how else would I hear it? <laughs> I love that story because what it sets up is the idea that the imagination is not just somewhere located somewhere in the brain, you know, or the third eye or between the eyebrows or somewhere like that. But the imagination, just like our, our energetic field or our aura, extends out uh, literally out into the universe, into this matrix that we're all connected, that uh, Hagelin, this scientist, called the unified field. Uh, this scientist, Hagelin, has done uh, uh, studies about meditation and how it affects uh, uh, how it affects consciousness, but also how it affects uh, groups of people when they meditate. 
uh, for a particular purpose, like heart patients, etc. Um, so I would want that anybody who is concerned about that, am I making this up, is be a scientist, experiment with it, see if it works for you. Uh, you know, I, I don't pretend that everybody's going to believe what I say. I don't want you necessarily to believe it, but don't disbelieve it either. You know, try it out. Your best, your best um, test for this is your own experience. We're moving into an era just uh, of, of direct revelation. You know, of um, really working with God or spirit or source or all that is, whatever you want to call that mysterious force that we keep having different names for, but God will do, spirit, the spirit will do. Um, as you um, go more directly to spirit and find methodologies like meditation, uh, shamanic journey, whatever it may be, to uh, listening to the world, listening to the communication from the world, all these different ways that we can really hear, see, listen, and feel God, uh, your life becomes a little smoother. Now, it doesn't mean everything's going to be idyllic. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you aren't going to have speed bumps or tests you know, put before you to, to really not just test your metal, but to help form and shape your soul's destiny. You know, it isn't just something that you set out, boom, you got it. It's like the, the, the response from the world itself helps shape that destiny. And um, I, I th I've done a lot of work on myself, as I know you have too, Jacob, or I assume so from what we've talked about. And it's not always been easy. You know, I've had to, uh, I'm in some ways amazed that I'm still here and alive. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I'm grateful for it at this point. And I still run it, and I do my work. I do my homework, you know, as best I can. I can't say I'm perfect at it, but uh, I do find that as I have evolved uh, psychologically and spiritually, and healed some wounds and the karmic uh, characteristic of some of those wounds, that um, how do I put it? I get over stuff pretty quickly, <laughs> you know. Uh, a friend of mine, and I can't say the actual way he said it, but he said, you know, m most things in life. Or ah shoot, oh well. <laughs> you can read between the lines, but it it really is the distance between ah shoot and oh well. And I must say that as I've continued to do the work that I I'm called to do here, that that distance becomes less and less. Like I mentioned, a 10-second tantrum. You know what's the point? You know okay ah oh, heck or I. I've been thinking how, especially we Americans, are kind of whiny, you know, a lot of the time. I, and I own that myself. I'm just as whiny as the next person. Uh, when we're, uh, oh, what was it? Oh, I didn't like this ice cream. I'd rather have had some different ice cream. Well, there's probably m millions of people in the world that would love to have ice cream, period, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's, I went off a little tangent with that, but uh, I trust that it's useful for uh, those listening. You know, one thing that's coming through right now, uh, a lot of people are having experiences, even as we're talking, and one just shared, um, TJ just shared um, something that happened recently, and she said, just a few days ago, I connected with a little girl from my past, not sure if past life or ancestor, but could very well be. Hmm. She'd been buried alive while being in a coma and hmm. not able to let them know she was in there. As hmm. you know, this extremely powerful connection. After... She shared with me her story. We talked, and she asked me to do one thing. She said, "Forgive before I die." Um, and and this individual who's writing this is getting ready to go back under. Um, she's going to have some pretty serious surgery, and um, and she said, "This this uh, girl that connected with her, she's she's with me, and together we're going to get through the fear and know all is exactly as it's meant to be." And uh, she just cool. says she loves your work and appreciates what you're talking about tonight. And, and thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. That's a uh, it was a conundrum for a, a period of time. Is uh, well, yeah, our past lives are really ancestral, or our ancestral memories really past lives. And I, I'm not sure that I've resolved it to my complete satisfaction, but because I've um, been a couple of dear friends of mine have shared stories about this. Uh, Jade, uh, who is a, a shamanic colleague, a shaman in his own right, uh, talked about this uh, 
what he uh, called his his mentor took him on a past life regression back to a Siberian shaman and they would sit and talk to each other across the fire and uh, the Siberian shaman uh, by Jade's request uh, taught him a lot of the ways that he was a familiar with Jade is um, a Mongolian Siberian he's got the, that that fold in the eyes and magnificent looking man and uh, uh, one, one thing led to another, and uh, this story is in the book as well, it's the Healing Ancestral Karma book. But at one point, uh, the old one that was with them, basically what came out, I, I, I can't, I'm not doing justice to the story, but basically what came out, Jacob, was, oh, that's me. Oh, and I'm him. And then they both had a good laugh about it. So is that past life or an ancestor? In this case, it was both. Right, and, and there are other couple other stories like that. So it it again, it's kind of one of those things. The conscious mind goes, well, it's got to be one or the other. But at, at the layer of the deep subconscious, which deals with uh, both and rather than either or, the conscious mind, well, it's got to be one thing or the other. The deep subconscious goes, no, it can be both, and it is. You know, one, I, one thing I love is that you're you're willing to do this work, and you're willing to bring it into um, you know, in, into the modern world and work with people directly who may be skeptics, may be, you know, aren't really open to it, but have hunger for this sort of information. I, I look at, um, even what you just said reminded me of that recent movie, which I loved, um, Cloud Atlas, and, um, you know, yes. and, and even, uh, you know, the one before, um, wow, it slipped my mind, but anyway, um, oh, Avatar. You know, it's interesting to watch these things bump up to the top of the popular collective consciousness, Dr. Farmer, and, and understand that what you're doing is actually responding to a call that's there, and you're helping yeah. moderns connect back with something that's in all of us, and many of us have been conditioned or trained or, you know, who knows how many generations worth of training to not pay attention to these things, not remember who we are, and that's why I just am so grateful you're doing this work. And why don't we just take one second? Um, I while we've been talking, I put a pop in um, so that uh, folks who are, are watching this can click over and take a look at your uh, the the, the pre-order page for your book. Um, why don't you, if you can, if you have seen that pop in and you can click through and take a look at Dr. Farmer's new book, why don't you just put in chat just just something? Uh, so I can make sure that uh, that actually worked. Um, but yeah, go take a look at the page. I, I put a link in there and it'll pull up the page. You can see the cover of his beautiful book, uh, Healing Ancestral Karma, Free Yourself from Unhealthy Patterns. Um, he asked the question, is it possible you've inherited the karma of your family members? And it also, second question is, could this explain why family members often go through same trials and tribulations generation after generation? And if so, is there anything you can do to break the cycle? On that same page, you'll get a little more information about the book, and you'll notice it's already available for pre-order. Uh, it'll come out this fall, but there's also a bonus, and for those of you who didn't get the bonus when you registered for the webinar, um, you can get that now, and it's a guided meditation uh, with Dr. Farmer receiving a message from a spirit animal. So you've actually had, uh, you've heard in his own voice and through some of these stories, connecting with spirit animals and the getting signs and symbols from you know nature around us, and that meditation will actually give you a direct experience of that. And, and, and Dr. Farmer, please, you wrote the book and you did the meditation. Please tell us a little more about this. Well, it's, um, it's again, it's been uh, one thread of my work has been uh, the communication with uh, animal spirit guides. And again, the 25 word or less um, uh, formula, I'll, I don't like that word, but the 25 word or less description of this would be that when an animal shows up in an unusual way or repeatedly, there's a message coming through. And that could be the actual animal or it could be a symbol of the animal, like a dream or something like that. Uh, the interpretation of that uh, might require a little bit of uh, contemplation. Sometimes the animal itself can give you clues, the characteristics of the animal. A hummingbird, uh, the ability to fly back and forth upside down might be telling you, hey, you've got to be a little more flexible. Uh, a hummingbird, a little, doo -doo -doo -doo, you know, the little flutter thing might tell you it's a. Uh, 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 well, what I, the message I get often from hummingbird is cheer up, lighten up, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, crow uh, may be uh, telling you to, uh, um, that you're in a period of, of, of manifestation.
you know, crow shows up several times, and so woo, uh, bringing uh, it's it's based on a uh, a one of the mythologies of the cre uh, creation is that uh, crow are actually more accurately cousins uh, cousin raven is the creator bird that brought from the darkness into the light that which was created and that we can see. Um, so this guided meditation that um, goes with the pre-order uh, gives you specific suggestions as to how you can pay attention to the world in a different way, especially animals that show up to you in this way, symbolically or, or physically, and again, whether in an unusual way or repeatedly. Not just, again, crows are just all abundant around here where I live. But if they show up in an unusual way, then something big is going on. And it is my uh, experience uh, that goes beyond my belief at this point that uh, it really is uh, spirit is sending that animal to you to try to get your attention. I had a hawk fly in one time, a uh, short story, I'll keep it real short. I was uh, goofing off. I was supposed to be writing, you know, one of my projects. And the hawk flew straight down the hallway and bam, right into the, the closed glass. Uh, screen door, a uh, um, sliding glass door, and immediately I said, okay, and the hawk was okay, by the way, just stunned, and I said, okay, hawk brother, this is what you can do, hawk brother, uh, what's your message, and immediately I heard the word focus, you know, in other words, stop moving off and get focused, you need to get this work done, as an example, there's hundreds of stories like that, people can actually go to my website, earthmagic.net, and they'll find a number of articles there, some of which talk about power animals and animal spirit guides as well, as well as keeping track of my schedule and signing up for my newsletter, once a month newsletter. So, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. And by the way, um, as a little corollary to that story I told you about, uh, you know, being at the music festival this weekend, took a hike, um, like the next day after some, some kind of big stuff had come up and was able to clear it and really got some good stuff done, but took a hike, uh, Stephen, out in the desert the next day, and this is way up in Washington State on the dry side of the mountains, and um, took two steps down the path, and I was the guy who was in front, and all of a sudden there was an enormous rattlesnake right on the edge of the path, hmm. and buzzing and, uh, you, know, doing, you know, doing what rattlesnakes do, and of course, I, you know, I'm a human being, I jumped a little bit, but, but then, I, then I leaned in to, to talk to him, I actually talked to him a little bit, cool. And the group was kind of, the, we had three or four of us there, and they were kind of freaking out, hey, get get back. And, you know, I was back a little ways, but I, I was able to lean in and get a picture. But I, I, I talked to him and just said, hey, it's okay, we're we're good. And and he, yeah. um, and that just kind of happened automatically. You know? and, but then he then he buzzed a little more, and then he just went on his way, and, and we were fine. He let us pass. But it, it's interesting to, to hear you talk about that. I'm, I'm just curious, from your perspective, um, what is, uh, what, what might be a sign from a, uh, you know, what might a snake symbolize? Oh, that's a great question, and I love. I think it's perfect for you based on what you said. Uh, snake is. It could be. You know, think about the characteristics of snake: shedding skin. Mm -hmm. You know, you could translate that as transformation. Mm -hmm. You know, the big uh, rattlesnake in particular is initiation. Uh, in I believe it's the Apaches. Uh, they there was uh, at one time ceremonies that were uh, when a uh, when someone was being initiated as a shaman. One way they would do that is they would have a, the group or the, the tribe circle around the man. He would go in the middle and they'd throw a bunch of rattlesnakes in there. And he would be bitten several times. And if he lived, he was considered to be a great shaman. <laughs> so, I think it's a little extreme for our contemporary culture, but you hear the metaphor in that too. Yeah. Is that uh, a very, mm -hmm. uh, very powerful initiation ceremony. And based on what you described, it sounds like there was an initiation into another another uh, widening of vision as you described it. So transformation, shedding an old skin, you know, an old skin that doesn't work, you know, you're done with it, okay. I've been told also snakes won't go near this the skin once it's been shed. Interesting. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> bye bye. Well I'm I I mean it's, again it's just it all of that was so recent and surprising that uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share it. And by the way, I see people are clicking through, and some uh, some have, have uh, reported back they've already pre-ordered your book, and so we're we're so grateful for that. And um, Dr. Farmer, I know that uh, we, wow, I, we've already been here about an hour and a quarter, and uh, respecting your time and and all. Why don't you tell us what you sounds like you have some things coming up soon where you're going to be live, and in case people would like to uh, find out about that, where where are you going to be next? 
Right. Uh, we're forming uh, more of the schedule now as, as we speak. I, we, I just talked to Jessica, who's my not only my wife, but my business administrator. She takes care of a lot of the details and sets up the workshops and such. Um, I will be uh, July, tw uh, July, excuse me, June 26th, I believe it is, uh, in Denver at uh, For Heaven's Sake. Um, that's a, a New Age bookstore in Denver. And I'll be doing... Um, I think I'm doing healing ancestral karma, actually, I think so. Plus, I'll be doing private sessions. The private sessions are shamanic healing and reading sessions, intuitive reading using my oracle cards. And the shamanic healing is absolutely fascinating, and it, it, it changes lives. You know, that's one thing I would say about it. Um, then I'll be at INAS, the International New Age Trade Show. So this is for oh, people who are uh, in the industry, in other words, bookstore owners, etc. So that's not a come one, come all kind of a thing. But I'm doing a book signing there with Satyama, who has produced the children's spirit animal cards, uh, S-A-T-I-A-M-A. -A. And again, this is the, the we're setting up things for uh, Australia. It looks like it's going gonna, it's gonna to go. I'll be in Australia. Uh, it's looking about the end of September. We Again, we're working with the dates right now uh, at a, uh, a keynote speaker at a conference there. I'll be in Canada, Toronto specifically, on October 18th and around there again with some workshops and private sessions. Um, there you are, okay, it just unfroze. It was frozen there for a sec. Um, and then I'm also looking at uh, New England, Circles of Wisdom, Andover, Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, etc. about three or four gigs there. Wonderful. And that wears me out just thinking about that. <laughs> I'm going to be busy in the fall. Yeah. But, that's the uh, you know, please, anybody that uh, writes or comes to see me, just let me know that you, uh, you were participating in this webinar. I definitely want to thank you, and God bless you all for uh, your willingness to uh, uh, talk about this and just to start sort of tossing and thinking about this, and I would say the last piece, really. Uh, the final piece is, again, as I said, be willing to be skeptical. I think it's great. You know, it's a good idea. Don't don't just believe, and not just me, but what, you know, don't, don't be blind about it. But, as I said, don't believe me or disbelieve me, but try this stuff out. You know, that's that's the real beauty, yeah. is to try it out. And as you, the, once you get the book, too, and read through it, love to hear your comments about it, because it, I'm really excited about it, Jacob. I, I, I can't wait. It's like I'm, I would be calling Randy, the publisher, once a week if I could say, is it done yet? Is it done yet? <laughs> so I guess September, late September, October, thereabouts, it's going to be actually a physical book. So Yeah, and we had a question from Sean asking about, you know, can we please have a Kindle? And, and the answer is yes, the Kindle will come out about the same time as the book physically releases in September. And um, just before we go, um, and, and I just have a tremendous amount of gratitude for your time on this, uh, Dr. Farmer, and sharing. And by the way, uh, you know, I see you have some beautiful drums and flutes and didgeridoos and all sorts of musical oh, instruments. Yeah. That's cool. Um, you chose tonight specifically. When we were setting this up uh, well over a month ago, you specifically wanted tonight, and that's because it's the new moon. Right. I would like to perhaps uh, send our send our friends who have joined us off tonight with just um, an understanding of what this means to you and what they might take with them from here? Yeah, new moon, uh, the moons, the lunar cycles, again, our ancestors long ago would follow these very closely. New moon, just think about the uh, metaphor of the new moon. It's, it's the start of something. Mm. You know, grandmother is just beginning to open her eyes again. And so it's a great time to initiate any projects uh, to put your intentions out there. By that, I mean you could do a ceremony, writing out two or three intentions. What do you want to see happen the next two weeks? Full moon, roughly two weeks uh, distance, is a time of completion. It's a time of expressing gratitude for what has come. So um, I was excited. I heard not too long ago one of my favorites. I'm, I'm a uh, maybe another lifetime uh, musician. You know, I. I'm a songwriter, too, and I've written songs and played, as you saw, some of the instruments. My guitar is right here. Uh, one of my heroes, my musical heroes, Neil Young, always starts a project on the new moon. Mm -hmm. I love that. I found it interesting. So that's what that means, and that's why I, when you gave me some possibilities, this day it was like, oh, I looked on the calendar and said, oh, it's new moon. It's new moon. So great. 
Well, I love I love that you. Um, I mean, even in private conversation and setting this up and and then what we've delivered tonight, um, you know, you're walking your talk in honoring the symbols, honoring the cycles, and all of that. And and I am further inspired um, by our conversation tonight and by the stories that have been shared, you know, from those who have joined us and by your own stories. And I'm excited about reading your book, um, working for the publisher. Um, I don't want to say neener, neener, neener to everyone else, but I'll get a chance to read it before it hits the public. But I'm, I'm very excited about your book. And um, most of all, though, I'm excited, Dr. Farmer, about that you're asking, I hear in your invitation to all of us, what is being invited, what, the, what we are inviting each other to do as a collective, which is to remember who we really are and then to step into that and to use that knowledge and that experience to truly live our birthright on this earth. It, would you agree with that? Well stated. Uh, I couldn't said uh, couldn't have said it any better, Jacob. You're wordsmith yourself. Yeah, it's um, but in a in not in just the the mental sense, but in the heart sense, mm -hmm. you know, is to really feel that sense of connection, that that the, the beauty in that connection of of uh, spirit. However, spirit is expressing itself. It's not that spirit expresses through us; it's we are spirit expressing as us. That tree is spirit expressing as tree. That uh, uh, that dog is expressing spirit as that dog. You know, it's it's a different take on it. Uh, this uh, saying we've had a while ago, uh, and I always get it backwards. But <laughs> we're we are uh, we're not just uh, spiritual human beings trying to be spiritual. We're spiritual beings trying to be human. And I say, nah, no, we're not. We're spirit. Period. End of story. You know, we are spirit expressing as Stephen, expressing as Jacob, etc., etc. It's a different. Way to consider it. Yeah, that comes from another dear mentor of mine who's always provocative whenever I have discussions with her. She threw that at me and I went, huh. It was one of those like 10,000 years, huh? Huh. It was one of those. So anyway, I, I go on and on. But again, I thank you. And I, Jacob, uh, you're a great interviewer. And uh, I particularly thank all of you who uh, participated by uh, listening in and your comments too on the chat. And again, uh, I want to put a pitch and check out the website, earthmagic.net. There's all sorts of good stuff in there. There's um, free oracle card readings. Uh, oh, just also go check it out. <laughs> and you you can explore it yourself, earthmagic.net. Well, um, Dr. Farmer, I mean, and again, I just, it's so much fun. In fact, I, I have this... Um, uh, what well, I'll call it a wish, perhaps that sometime in the next couple of years, we 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 find some really cool mountain place, and we invite uh, you know as many as can come to have a great big campfire um, retreat weekend with you. And uh, if 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 that plants a seed that of possibility in you, um, I'll be the first to sign up. So I think it'd be a wonderful thing to spend a weekend uh, just sort of soaking all, in all this and. Uh, Again, thank you so much for spending time with, with us tonight and everyone who did join us and join in in the conversation and share your stories and your experiences. Um, as Dr. Farmer said, earthmagic.net, I put a link down here in the chat so you can click right straight through there. And I, I encourage you, I'm on his newsletter list, I encourage you to sign up and uh, just get, get these uh, monthly communications and ideas and more information. Um, and of course, if you hadn't, you know, pre-order the book. We'll make sure that you know about how to do that in the future. But um, right. connect with Dr. Farmer, and he, uh, you have a, you have a Facebook page. I, I get those things. What's, uh, what's your Facebook page? It's uh, Dr. Stephen Farmer. You know, it's a professional page, and it's got, you know, uh, you know, I'll put announcements, etc., in there, and also inspirational quotes and photos and things like that. So, Dr. Stephen Farmer you know, on Facebook. Well, Dr. Farmer, do you have any any final words, or are we good to go? That's always a tough one. You want to play a flute or a didgeridoo or something? We could uh, sign off with a didgeridoo. Yeah, I could play. Didgeridoo is interesting. I, again, I don't want to go into a long story about it, but it, it, I came across it in Australia years ago, and I just love it. And there's various um, mythologies about how the what the didge served. One of comes to mind immediately is that um, back when, you know, 100,000 years ago, uh, one of the aboriginals uh, took a eucalyptus branch and uh, looked in and there was termites in it. And so he took and blew out the termites and it became the stars. 
Isn't that beautiful? That's There's beautiful. other stories like that. You know, it's again, um, I think that uh, I, I would go back to my dear mentor, uh, who is an ancestor at this stage, Angela Sarian, and just uh, add, invite out all of the listeners to answer those questions because that also provides the prescription with the answers. When did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop being enchanted by stories? And when did you stop listening to the sweet sound of silence? And um, thank you, Angelus, for all your beautiful work. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>